Thank you. Uh, okay, Isaiah chapter 1. We can just maybe perhaps go through this very quickly. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe perhaps going through the lockdown period, it allowed time for us to think, or it allowed me to think. Uh, to question what am I doing, why am I doing what I'm doing, to do a proper evaluation of whether we are successful or not, uh, are we trying to achieve what we are meant to achieve, um, and why repeat what we have always been doing if it's not been successful, if it's not God's will. And so perhaps there are three things I'd like us to consider, but before we do that, let us go into Isaiah. The people that are very religious, uh, in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the Lord, unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. In spite of them being very religious, God refers to them as a people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of ye goats. If you stop, these are actually the things that God expects from them. He had laid down this as part of the law, but yet God is not happy. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who had required this at your hand to tread my course? Perhaps I can steal that thought, and maybe perhaps even give it uh, this, maybe lesson time, uh, a title, who had required this at our hand? So why do we do what we are doing? Verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. I think about so much time, so much effort, so much sacrifice made by these people to put in all of these different things. Yet God is not pleased at all. He's disgusted with everything that is taking place. Verse 15, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Verse 16, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Verse 17, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. I think with lockdown, it brought about a lot of um, obstacles in, in the ministry. Um, maybe perhaps even as I spend time, and perhaps even yourself, just thinking things through, Perhaps you also came up with some of the things that we're going to consider today. Um, I'm asking some questions as well. I don't necessarily have the answers. It would be nice if we could all maybe perhaps put our brains together and maybe look for the best possible solutions. Lessons that I have learned regarding three issues. Sorry, it's no longer, you know, when it bounces. Uh, is the church about the building or the believer? What is priority to you and to me? What is priority uh, to the leadership regarding these things? What do we try to instill within our people in terms of what is priority? Is, is it the building or is it the believer? Is ministry about a program or people? Do we just get involved in making sure that I'm involved in something, making sure that each member within the church is participating in some sort of program or are they involved with people? And then lastly, thirdly, is my priority about raising another shepherd? Or is it about the sheep? I'm a, I don't know what I am, whether I'm a church planter or a pastor, um, but as both, I think, we often uh, assume or try to strive to achieve these things. We try to strive to achieve a building. As long as I do not have a building, I'm not successful in church planting. Um, as long as I don't have a program running with a good attendance and individuals within the church participating in that program, I feel as if we are, we are not uh, progressing, there's no growth, we are failing. If I have not raised a man to take my place, I'm also su not successful. I cannot leave until he has been raised. But as we go through this, 
For as the Lord has allowed me even to think these things through, it has made me, made me realize that, listen, it's got nothing to do with a building. It's got nothing to do with a program. It's got nothing to do with whether I've raised another shepherd. Those might be important, but they are secondary. What is more important is the believers. What is more important is the people. What is more important is the sheep. So the church, if we can start off with that, the church, my eyes are not very good so I can't see so far. The church, is the church about the believer or the building? We are all familiar with uh, what the church is. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, Jesus says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The word church we know is just in reference to a gathering together of believers, a coming together, an assembly or a meeting together of believers. By that word believer, I do not mean individuals who acknowledge truth regarding Jesus, but rather individuals who put their trust in Jesus. Those individuals, whenever ever they gather together, we know that that is the church. The church is not about a building. It is a gathering of all those who sins have been forgiven, who already have a right standing before God. A synonym for the word church would actually be believers, and we find this in the Bible. Very, very quickly, Matthew chapter 18, verse 17. It says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, Tell it unto the church. In other words, who do we address this issue to? We address it to those who are believers. Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it speaks of a great persecution that was uh, implemented by Saul. A great uh, persecution was against the church. Again, the idea there that the word church is in reference to the believers. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 24. It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. The point is, again, it's in reference not to a building, but it's in reference to believers, a group of individuals. A building should never be considered sacred. Consider 1 Corinthians, again, portions of scriptures that we know. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. We believe this. It's something that we uh, know to be true. It is something that we would state, we, we, what we would preach. But practically, is it true? The idea here is that we must consider that the building is not sacred, but rather the believer, the body of the believer. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The word temple in both verses just simply speaks of the dwelling place. So the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, like we know, is the believer, and it is not the building. Have you ever heard, maybe individuals say, maybe even myself or you, God's people no longer have respect for God's house. But God's house, it is, it is not the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. It is not some sacred, uh, sacred place. Or have you heard, it was so good to be in the house of God. No, the house of God, it is the body of the believer. He indwells the body of the believer and not the building. Or perhaps, have you heard, the house of God is being neglected. Or perhaps, maybe uh, Haggai misquoted when it speaks of, it is time for you, sorry, it is not time for you to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lieth in waste. Consider your ways. No, this is just a building. It's irrelevant. It's of no importance. It's just an issue of convenience. And so we gather together, no matter where it might be, uh, as believers known as the church to build and to edify each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Where did the early church meet? Again, we are familiar with this, but again to emphasize that it's not, it's not about the building. It's about the believers. 
And I think sometimes, maybe perhaps I have forgotten that or not really believed it, but I think it is true as well of our people. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, speaks of a husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla. Yeah, in Corinthians it says, with the church that is in their house. The same reference is to them in Romans chapter 16. Colossians, it speaks of another in individual, Nympus, and the church which is in his house. Philippians chapter 1 verse 2 says, And to our beloved Apophia and Archippus, our fellow soldiers, and to the church in thy house, in Philemon's house. So in other words, where did the church meet? It was never ever about a building. They met in each other's homes. They met in houses. So like we say, or we see on that far right hand side, where we meet is irrelevant. A building is convenient, but it is not what Jesus Christ is building. I wonder actually, the Lord Jesus Christ, I wonder how much interest he actually has in the building. The building is of, none, or of no importance. So, is it about the building, or is it about the believer? You know, we may worship in a building, but the building itself must never be idolized. It is not the holy of holies. One of the biggest sins, I'm not saying this, but it's the mentality of us as believers, that one of the biggest sins that you can commit is eating in the chapel. Or, woe unto you if you make a mess in the sanctuary. It is just a building. It is just a convenient meeting place for the believer. Today, it's actually very, very sad, but it's true, it's a reality that today, millions of money is put into buildings and hundreds of thousands simply to maintain them. Not to forget the thousands of rands to ensure and to protect them. How much is actually invested into the lives of the believer? I think we're losing perspective. We must not lose focus of where the true value lies, where the true value is. Now, I'm not trying to tell us in any way that we must be irresponsible. I'm not trying to say that we just leave it all a, a mess or just uh, use it however we want to. There is a sense of responsibility. But I think for some of us, maybe especially me, it's become about the building and to the point you neglect the, the believer. Consider 1 Corinthians 14, 12, the purpose of why we meet. It says, even so he, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek, make this your ambition, strive for this, seek that you may excel, that you do way above the norm, that you excel to the edifying of the church, to those who come together and meet. The word edifying means to build up. What are we building? The building or the believer? What are we looking to encourage and to establish? It is, is it the building or the believer? You know, we make or we look to make sure that the comfortable become more comfortable. We make sure that those who know convenience are actually made more convenient. Yet we are oblivious or even callous to those within our church or brother or sister churches who have tremendous needs. We go out of our way to make this environment homely, to make this environment a place where they can come in, a tool that can draw them in. As long as they're here, they must feel important or be made comfortable. But that's not, that's not our priority. The, the priority is the believer. We make sure the grass gets cut, the windows are wiped or they are closed, and that the coat of Dulux weather guard is applied at least once a year. But have you ever just once, just once, paid for that little boy's haircut? Or stooped to wipe her nose? Or tied her shoelaces? Or perhaps simply just express your compassion through a simple loving smile? It's not about the building. We ensure that the building is prim and proper. And that all of its corners are in the exact places. The chairs are wiped, they are in line and correctly spaced. But what about those faces, those lives? Have they studied? Have they memorized? Have they eaten? Have they experienced love and family when they were invited to stay with me and dine? 
We create a budget for this and for that, not forgetting the building's constant upkeep. But how much is invested in the upkeep of its believers to those who are in constant attack by the elements of all that is cruel, nasty, and unkind? So I trust that maybe perhaps very, very briefly we can consider or maybe be reminded that what we're involved in, it's not about the building. It is about the believer. I have experienced many, many times individuals being offended just simply because they did something wrong in the building. It's not about the building. It is about the believer. May we remember that. Secondly, um, it's not just about a program. It is about people. Specifically, I'd like us to consider children's ministry. But before we do that, what is ministry? It is the act of serving someone else. A minister, it is strange, it's actually in reference to a deacon, should be true of a pastor as well, but also of our members. A minister is one who attends to the needs of others. It is taken from a Latin word just simply meaning a servant. A servant has no uh, time of his own. A, term, a, a servant has no space he can call his own. A servant is constantly under the will of somebody else, following out their desires. God's church as a whole is called to be ministers and to do, it, do, and to do ministry. Yes, in different ways. Ministry is not a calling for some, but rather it is the privilege for all believers. Ministry is not reserved for the elite. It is not for those who attend Bible college. It is not just for the pastor. It is for all our members. Ministry is not limited, nor is it restricted to preaching or teaching. Really, that is the easy part. A servant slaves. So then, how do we get our people to slave, to serve each other? Have we limited, and we can think about it, uh, you can discuss it amongst yourselves, but have we as churches, have we limited or restricted what ministry is and who can do it? I think I have because ministry in my mind and in the mind of my people is behind this pulpit. And there are certain individuals who can only do that. Or it happens in our Sunday school classes. But ministry is more than that. So have we limited or restricted what ministry is and who can do it? Is one type of ministry more important than the other? Again, this is ministry standing behind the pulpit, but it is a ministry that has been elevated above the other. If you're not behind the pulpit, you almost feel as if you're not a striving Christian. At least that's the mentality that I have. And that's also the mentality that I've seen amongst my people. They elevate one over the other. Yet in Corinthians, which one is most or seen as more important. The one that is actually insignificant, the one that is actually, uh, if you can say, uh, ugly, uh, of no value in our eyes. The Lord values that more. Are our, are our people involved, listen, in full-time ministry? Full-time ministry is not when you leave your job to serve. Are our people involved in full-time ministry? Be it in your homes, be it where they work, where they school, is it their lifestyle? We are to let our light shine. Does their light shine through this mere act of serving people? A tremendous expression of love, a tremendous expression of humility. So ministry, that's what ministry is. Where should ministry take place? Remember, the early church had no church building. And so again, immediately we almost need to sit down together and begin to discuss or to begin to evaluate or ask the Lord, Lord, what is your will regarding what is ministry and where should it take place? Today, a lot of ministry happens only within the church building. Many people only serve within the building. So when lockdown happened, what happened to ministry? It stopped. And so something is not right. Where must ministry take place? Well, that's for you and me for, for us to think and pray about. Some thoughts regarding ministry, and I'm just asking, I'm not saying these are necessarily wrong, but is ministry really, is it cleaning and packing away the church's chairs? Is it really setting out the hymn book? Is that the standard? 
Making sure, is this ministry making sure that the windows are closed when everybody leaves? Is ministry making sure the dishes are washed after the meeting? Is ministry me controlling the sound box or the overhead projector? Is ministry involved when I'm involved in the praise and worship team? Is that ministry? I think a lot of these may be seen as some form of ministry. But ministry is more than just these. We must just, sorry, we must just think, what have these replaced? So if we're saying this is ministry, what have these, if they are not ministry, what have they actually replaced? If they've replaced that which we are supposed to be doing, then it means that that what we're supposed to be doing is being neglected. What are we no longer doing that should actually be done? Perhaps, maybe, I, don't, I do not know, just thinking things through. Sitting behind that box, uh, controlling the sound, are we actually trying to soothe his conscience? Are we trying to cater for him and maybe limit and restrict his ability to serve and to minister? Has this understanding of ministry, ministry created a sense of complacency? I'm doing my best, I'm serving God. I'm behind that box controlling the sound or the music. So have we actually neglected ministry? Ministry demands from us. A servant, he's a slave. He works to the point of being tired or weary. Maybe we can consider a children's ministry. Um, a typical children's club or Sunday school program, nothing necessarily wrong with these. Um, but I'm in a position, like I say, during lockdown where I evaluated. I thought things through like most of us. And if I have to say my success rate, it's not looking very, very good. We have to be honest on what is there, what is happening. Um, over the many, many years that I've been involved in children's ministry, I've had interaction with hundreds of children. And yet I can count on my one hand individuals that are currently still living for the Lord. They love him. They are seeking to honor and trust him with their lives. So something is not right. We are not doing something that is biblical. A typical Sunday school or children's program is Bible songs, Bible memory, games, awards, snacks and drinks, Bible message. I have nothing necessarily wrong with this. But this tends to happen at a specific time in a specific place. This seldom demands for me to be a servant. This seldom costs me anything. I think it's almost a hit, a hit and run situation. I've gotten to or I've come to the position where I can just, I've managed to tick off my presence. I've marked off my duties. And then I can continue living for self. A servant constantly living for the other. When I think of ministry, when I think of children's ministry, I think of a parent. A parent has to nurture they have, they have to develop and cultivate that individual. When you look at our normal Christians Sunday school program or children's club, club, there's no time to nurture, no time to develop. We're always pushing for time. We start at this time, we end at that time. There's more to them just coming and knowing songs. There's more to them just coming and learning Bible verses. There's more to them coming and having fun and games. Let me illustrate. For those of us who are parents, I give my children Bible verses to learn. I give my, my children Bible songs to learn. I encourage them uh, to develop a relationship with God. I sit with them and we talk about the things of God. I tell them Bible stories. They know it all. But that's not where they learn to grow. That's not where they learn to develop uh, their character and learn to live for Christ. I'm constantly in their lives. I'm constantly watching them, monitoring them. As soon as I see faults, I don't kick them out of my home. I begin to nurture them. I begin to develop them. That's not how you treat your sister. That's not how a Christian must behave. That's not what Christ expects of you. How is it possible for us to understand these children if it's a hit and run type of program? We've got to get involved in their lives so that we can nurture them, so that we can understand where they fail, their shortcomings, where the Lord needs to address or what issues the Lord needs to address in their lives so that I can nurture them, 
develop and cultivate them. Nurturing, I need to nurture them spiritually. In other words, there's many things. We're talking about children. There's many things that they face, many, many challenges, many sins they themselves need to overcome. Their view of life, it needs to change. It cannot happen in a normal, typical Sunday school setting. You pitch up, I test you on your memory verse, and then I give you the lesson, and then off you go. But no, what are they actually struggling with? What sins are constantly uh, pulling them down? Do they trust the Lord? How do they trust him? When do they trust him? I must nurture that. I tell my children so many times, do not run in the house. You think they know not to run in the house? I've got to constantly remind them, constantly nurture, develop, and cultivate that. What about emotionally? I do not know the setups that your children come from. I'm sure Leondale is like that. Uh, definitely like that. I'm sure maybe other churches as well. Definitely, actually. Um, but can you imagine the emotional issues that our children have? Their parents got divorced, and we bringing them into the class and teaching them John 3.16, but yet consider the emotional pain, that stress, whatever thoughts they are go- that is going through uh, within, their mi- within their minds. Some of them receive that uh, physical abuse, uh, that verbal abuse, whatever other abuse, they face it. How has it impacted them emotionally? If it is my child, what do I do? Do I just tell him, learn John 3.16? No, I begin to get involved, I develop, I nurture, I, I sit with him and I, I walk life with him. Some of them have immense unforgiveness. Some of them have immense issues and burdens and yet they are children. They have anger issues, they have so much hatred. We must get involved and we must nurture. Physically, some of them, think about it, the guy's stomach is empty And again, we're teaching him John 3.16. He has health issues. He has clothing issues. No problem. We can thank the Lord. They are coming. I agree 101% that the preaching of the word is important. It is vital. It is that tool that God uses to touch their heart. But again, my children get that. They get it more than those children who come to church. But yet I realize that I must nurture my children. I must be actively, constantly involved in their lives. I must nurture them mentally. Think about this. Our children are uneducated. Can't read and he's a 17-year-old boy. He does not know how to do his times table, his vertical subtraction or vertical addition. And here we come and we say, listen, I don't want to undermine this, but yes, God loves you. But there's more to his life than just that. And you only begin to realize that when you become a minister, when you begin to serve your people, when you get involved in their daily lives, you realize that there's, well, there's tremendous needs. They can't read, sad. They can't comprehend. They do not have the ability to think things through logically. So what women are we raising? What men are we raising? Men who might be familiar with where the book of Hezekiah is, No, book of Hezekiah, sorry. The book of Isaiah is, but yet there's no substance. There's no substance to their lives. You see, this demands more of my time, more of my space, more of my money, more of my energy, more of my home, more of my fuel, and the list goes on. This demonstrates a servant's heart. This demonstrates an individual's Christians who possess true concern and true compassion for their people. This demonstrates a desire to be successful. I don't mean in terms of numbers. I mean in terms of that individual, something good is going to become of his life. He's going to go through school. He's going to graduate, get a good job. The Lord's going to bless him with a good spouse, and they're going to have a family. And then that whole cycle begins to start again. Something good of their lives. I think we've got to have the attitude more of nurturing. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 15 says, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Obviously the word rod speaks of the stick or the belt. I don't know if if you want to use that, it's up to you. I'm in a situation where I can use it, right? Uh, My wife, Whether she's in that situation or not, she will use it. 
Right? Doesn't matter whose child it is. Reproof, the word reproof speaks of giving correction. It speaks of reasoning with someone. Think about that. It's not about me standing behind the pulpit and banging it. It's about coming down to your level and we discuss these things through. Let us reason together. It's about giving counsel, giving warning. That's what I do with my children. Imagine how silly I would be if I had to stand every morning during our devotion time. I open the Bible and I begin to even change my voice and I begin to pound, pound on the, the table. I would look crazy. I come down to them and I counsel. I give them things to think through. I'm nurturing them. We never neglect our babies. We would never leave them, our young children, to clean themselves, to dress themselves, to feed themselves, to educate themselves, to defend for themselves, to raise themselves. But this is what we are doing in ministry with the children that God has brought our way. We're expecting, we give them information, the information is good, but we're expecting them to go home and train themselves. It is not possible. A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Is that there? Train up the child in the way he should go. I've heard uh, maybe John MacArthur and his group discuss this or explain the verse. I'm going to just say what I see. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I see certainties. I see guarantees. I think maybe we are scared that when people see the fact that our children have failed, they're going to point fingers at us. And, but that is the reality. I, if I did not nurture, if I did not raise them to be what God wanted them to be, I can never expect them to be that. The reason why our children show respect is because we implement it, we try to instill it within their lives. When they are older, they continue to show that respect. When we... Uh, show our children um, how to maybe serve, or how to do whatever it is, how to wash dishes, whatever it might, how to make your bed in the morning, whatever it might be. As they grow older, those things are installed within their lives. But it happens not by chance. It happens as we take the initiative to discipline, to train them up, to teach, to give them skill, which the book of Proverbs is, to give them skill or a type of behavior through practice and instruction, over a period of time. Anyway, we need to do more than, I think, what we are doing. Perhaps maybe the reason why I have failed in ministry, why so many have come through our doors and so many are left by the wayside, is because we are not parents to them. Understand maybe the meaning of this, but we do not look after them. We do not take care of them. We do not rear them and nurture them. As soon as they put the foot wrong, we tell them, never come back here again. I don't want to see you here. This doesn't have to go fight over there. No, they need our nurturing. They need our tender care. We can never be, we are not parents to them. Also, secondly, we are not present. It is not about their attendance on a Sunday morning, but rather my presence in their lives during the week. And that's a servant. As I make myself present in their lives, either in their home or them in my home or in their church building on a regular basis, I'm interacting with them. I'm developing a relationship. The care and concern in my heart becomes bigger and greater for them. Then I ultimately begin to recognize and be aware of their needs. So therefore, I then become more practical. So we are not practical. We are, not, we are all living in a real world, but our world is different to their world. They are facing different challenges to me. I remember a young boy coming to the church, and it's so sad. A young boy coming to the church, he only told me this later. But why didn't I know this sooner or earlier? He would come to church. I was happy to always see him. But he was coming to church with his mother's disapproval. And when his mother would find out that he was in church, she would discipline him. She would beat him, beat him or abuse him. There were times that she even said he must sleep outside in the toilet on the cold floor. So where was I? Why was I not practical? How would he as a young man handle that situation? How must he overcome that struggle? Where does he draw his strength or his comfort? What must the thoughts that he possesses, what must they be? I was not practical. I was teaching him that he needs to evangelize the world. But 
good, but he has a young boy and he's growing. I firstly needed to nurture him. It would not be possible, it was not possible because I was not present. Therefore, I was no longer practical. I was not being of any help to him. Therefore, as a result of all of this, we are not productive. We're not producing boys and girls, men and women, families and homes which can stand, which love the Lord, which seek to honor and trust him with their lives, who are a bright, shining light for Jesus. Shining lights not through their words, but through their lives. What testimony does he have if he's still failing in school? But he's trying to tell them that Jesus loves them. He's the laughing stock of the, of the class, of the school. There's more to his life than just that. And so ministry, maybe lastly with regards to that, Jesus says in Matthew 18 verse 5, And whoso shall receive such... Sorry, can I turn here? Matthew chapter... You can also use your Bible if you can't see. Matthew chapter 18 verse 5. Jesus is speaking, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it was better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and, he, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The word offend means that we cause him to trip or to stumble. It has the idea that we entice him to sin. We put within his heart some sort of displeasure based either on our treatment of him. We cause him or her to resent us or to feel bitterness towards us, either because we treat them as if they are second-class Christians due to their age. And that should not be. Look at verse 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Do not think against them. Do not set them on the number line on that number zero. Do not possess within your heart a hatred for them. Or to think that they have no concern or value. Do not think lowly of them. We'll easily offend them. So many actions, so many attitudes that we demonstrate before them. And that shouldn't be the case. Matthew 19 verse 1. Jesus in Matthew 18 has just taught his disciples regarding the children. But yet he goes over to Galilee. I do not know how much time has passed. But look at verse 13 of Matthew chapter 19. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, do not admonish or forbid them to come to me. They must come to me. Do not send them forth. Do not forsake them. Do not tell them to go away. They must come to me. And lastly, the shepherd. Um, so it's not about a building. It's about people, believers. It's not about uh, a program. It's about people. And then lastly, it's not about a shepherd, but rather the sheep. The shepherd, just by the way, I know we just try to keep this in mind. Yeah, sure. Okay, I will just, maybe it's not meant to be, right? So let's keep it. Um, hope you can see that. But the shepherd, we must realize that not all are called to preach and teach. We believe it. It's part of our doctrine. We'll teach it. But what about it, implementing it practically? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29 says, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? In light of this fact, we should stop pushing for all our people to be preachers and teachers. They don't need to attend our Bible college classes. They don't need to feel pressured to do so. It does a lot of damage. It does damage to the one who is actually called or gifted to preach and teach because he's often top of the class. He's often considered to be Mr. Spiritual. He knows how to handle the scriptures. He's so easily, he can so easily be lifted up with pride. Very, very dangerous. Secondly, it does lots of damage to the one who is not gifted in that area. He's easily discouraged 
because he's not seen as Mr. Super Spiritual. But yet his life or lifestyle may, may be way better than the other guy. He's often considered or felt or there's that sense that he's a failure. And so you can begin to imagine that's the par and he's not meeting, meeting up to that par. He's always coming short of it. So you can imagine how he burdens himself with this unnecessary load and the immense discouragement that he faces. But then thirdly, it also affects the people. They need to grow. They need to hear truth. But yeah, not to sound funny, but yeah, he's almost one who is making these things almost like a laughing stock. Because he's not making sense. He's trying to teach. He's trying to preach. He's trying to make God's word simple so God's people can understand it, go home and apply it to their lives. It's not coming through. And so that whole time spent with God's people is lost and they feel like, whoa, what's going on? Sometimes... The discouragement happens even to their people, God's people, where somebody else is saying, what a good message, what a good teaching. But yet the other guy in his mind knows, but yo, I got nothing from that. Something is wrong with me. So we actually end up doing more damage than any good. So we must stop pushing for preachers and teachers. The church is bigger than them. Our goal and purpose is bigger than just that man or that individual or that family. A preacher or teacher is often gifted. We nurture him then as pastors, uh, and a lot of that nurturing also evolves around time spent in the pulpit. But even regarding that, there's more to his life than his pulpit ministry. He's put behind the pulpit, sometimes even prematurely, because what is happening with him at school? Is he passing? Has he learned how to implement discipline? Is he still procrastinating, showing a life of laziness? Or is he showing an individual who is dedicated, maybe struggles with certain issues in school? Has he learned to give those issues to the Lord? So as a man, as an individual, in terms of his character, are we nurturing him there? Or is it all about how he alliterates? Or is it all about how he comes and he articulates right? Is it all about his presentation, everything that happens behind this pulpit? His life is more than just the life behind here. Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and with men. What is his life like at home? Does he make up his bed? Does he help his mom with the dishes? Is he a servant at home? There's more to his life than just this. I know of so many young guys, attended Bible college, and so many times we have conversations where they still say, Pastor, I'm still struggling with A, B, and C. Pastor, how do I overcome these things? But he's a great preacher. He's a great guy behind the pulpit. But what about his life? And so we as pastors, as maybe men of God or leadership, we must not push our people to be preachers and teachers. We must realize that there are different types of gifts given to God's people. He's the one who decides the spiritual gift, the Holy Spirit. It's got nothing to do with me or anybody else. So therefore, therefore, every individual with their spiritual gift is different and is unique. The Holy Spirit has enabled each one to do his will, to do something for him. Next one. I don't know if it's going. It's not. Battery is maybe flat. I must realize that the body is not about one body part, but about rather about many. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, For as the body is one, and had many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For the body is not one member, but many. There's more to the church than that one shepherd that I'm looking to raise. Therefore, we must not just cater for the pastor or the teacher. We must cater for all, for all. It's sad we have Bible college, no father college, no student college, no mommy college, no teenager college, no young adult college, no worker college, no parent college. We invest so much time and money in all of these things. But what about the people, the church? There's more than just that one body part. They are all members. They are all equally important and necessary. And there's more to accomplish than just 
another preacher or teacher. Therefore, we must labor and invest in all. So, lessons that I perhaps learned was to consider what we do, where has God required this of us? Where did he say this is what I want? And so as a church, we need to maybe perhaps get back into God's word and consider where are we. We must be reminded that the church is not about the building, but about the believer. And that's where we place the value. That's where we pour in the money. That's where we put in all our effort, all our energy, all our time. Because the building is of no significance. As Christians, we must ask who had required this of us. Is ministry about a program or about a people? Is it just about something that starts this time, ends that time, and these are the things we go through, hit and run? Who had required this of us? Is ministry not about people and not about a program? We need to, but it costs us, you see, we need to invest more. It demands more from us. Thirdly, we've seen what is priority for the shepherd. Is it raising another shepherd or is it the sheep? Again, who had required this? Of us. So when I'm successful, how do I know? Am I successful because I've obtained a building? Am I successful because I've developed a good program? Am I successful when I've raised yet another shepherd? But when I take stock of my people and I consider where they are spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, where are they? Does it reflect the fact that I'm a servant to them? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are, for your, the time we could spend together. I trust that we would consider what has been said. I pray that the Holy Spirit would constantly remind us and that your will would be done in our lives, especially with all these different lives that we are busy with. I pray that you'd make something good. Help us to see it cannot just happen, cannot happen by chance or overnight. So we pray that we would be willing to be servants, individuals that give away everything for you so that something good can become of their lives. Work in our hearts. We ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.